Good morning, everybody. Welcome once again to the Sunday Morning Digital Cathedral. If this is your first time with us, we welcome you, and I would encourage you to go ahead and hit the like and hit the subscribe. When you hit the subscribe, uh, YouTube will let you know every time that we're coming on here at the Digital Cathedral. I want to finish up what I started last week. Last week, we began to look at what the Father is doing in us individually and what he's doing with us corporately here at the Digital Cathedral as he continues to develop us. And um, what we really wanted to focus in on last week, and I'll finish it up this week, I wanted to make sure that we remain Christocentric, Christ-centered, Jesus-centered, as we continue to develop this lifestyle of identity as divinity, and now we're really beginning to see a lot of revelation on the creative power that we have as I am coming out of I am that I am. He is I am that I am. That's how he defined himself. When Moses, when he sent Moses to the Egyptians, he says, tell them that I am that I am sent you. And in that I am that I am, I am Moses was able to go and say, I am a sent one. So we're going we're gonna to look at some things over the next weeks and months that I think are absolutely going to rock your world, turn it upside down, revamp some things, and it's going to turn you into a, a person that is able to be not only a walking billboard of grace to the world that they can read, but we're going to begin to manifest some things in this area of creativity, which I think is so vital for the world to actually see the Father that sent us, and the blueprint and the mission that we have to fulfill here on planet Earth. I want to begin this morning over in John chapter 14. I'm going to work, I think, pretty much all out of the New King James this morning. So if you want to put your phone app on or grab your Bible, if you have a New King James, we're going to read this morning several verses, and we're going to finish up on what the Father is doing in our life individually. And as He works in our life individually, then corporately we build a, a community culture that I think is phenomenal right now. This digital cathedral thing, when I started it three years ago, when I came out of the building, I no longer pastor in a building. I think my, my ministry right now is worldwide. I mean, we're touching people. You and I are touching people all over the world as we partner together to carry this message that religion looks at and says, man, this is too good to be true. There's gotta be, there's gotta be a hook. There has to be an if, an and, or a but, but it's not. So let's make sure we remain Christ-centered <clears throat> and everything that we do, especially as we develop divinity as identity, because this is this is new ground to so many millions of people. And also, as we start to look at what I am encompasses as developers. So let's remain Christocentric. So let's finish up on some things I want you to recognize coming in your life and also in a larger community like the Digital Cathedral. Jesus said this in John chapter 14 and verse 12. He said, most assuredly, I say to you, he that believes in me, the works that I do, will he do also. A lot of works that Jesus did were creative miracles. They were, he, he produced something out of nothing, or he took a little bit and created something that was much larger. So he said, the works that you do, will I do also, and greater works than these, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. What Jesus is doing there, Jesus is reaching out, he's stretching out his hands, and he's bringing us into his world, which is really our world also. And he's saying, the things that I did, you're going to do also. He's, he's, he's stretching us. There's a stretch in that verse that most people are, are going to walk away from shaking their head and say, that's just mission impossible. He's stretching us to his life in the spirit. He's stretching us to his level of life in spirit. That's what I wanted to say. He's showing us that we are connected with him to the same source and we can bear the same fruit, the fruit of creativity that Jesus bore. Now we've read verses like that. We've read verses like John 14, 12, and 13, uh, and, and we just kind of blew by him. We just, we just looked at those and said, that's a pipe dream. I don't see any way that that could ever possibly happen. That's Jesus. Now watch what we say, I am. That's Jesus and, and I am just me. That's, he's entirely different. He's on a different, different level than, watch this, he's on a different level than I am. Do you see what we just created with our I am? We just created ourselves on a different level than what he is. That's the wrong I am. He's setting the bar. He's, he's, he's reaching out, he's lifting us up. He's setting the bar beyond what I can do naturally. And honestly, that's good. Now, 
religion would look at that, and maybe you're looking at it this morning and say, well, that, that kind of stuff's okay for him, but it's not me. I want to, I want to read another verse for you from, from Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, very, very familiar verses. You know, a lot of these verses we read a lot, but I'm telling you, you can read the same verse a gazillion times, and every time you read it, you get something absolutely brand new out of it. Let me, let me just point something out here in Romans chapter 8 and verse 29. Romans chapter 8, verse 29, it says this, For whom he foreknew, which is all of us, he foreknew us. See, we, we look at the things of Jesus, what Jesus said, we say, well, that's Jesus, that's fine, but that I, I am not that. Well, let me just point something out here. Every person that says in verse 29 that he foreknew, which is all of us, there's nobody that slipped onto the planet that he did not know about. So he foreknew all of us. Those that he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Paul is saying the same thing that Jesus said in John chapter 14, that what Jesus did, the father's conforming us into the pattern of the son that we might do what he did. John said, as he is, so are we in this world. All saying the same thing, all in agreement. He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that Jesus might be the firstborn or be the patterned son among many. Jesus will always be the firstborn. There's no, there's no getting around. That's his position. But he is the firstborn among many. So can I suggest to you, and I'm just submitting this, what if your number's in there too? And what if your number... 48,758,312,000 is no different than number one. In the Father's eyes, there's no difference. So, embracing your divinity and beginning to exercise your I amness means that we're also embracing Christ in us as us. Now, that can be a major obstacle to overcome in our thinking because we have taken Christ and separated him from us in our thinking. We've put him at one place and us on another. Let me explain something to you that you know, but let me remind you, Christ is not the last name of Jesus. <laughs> it was a recognition of who he was and what he did. He was under authority and the power of, of the Father, and as, as one that was submitted to the Father in all things, he had a, a Christedness. Now that word Christ comes from the word creo and it just means, it just means anointed. It's an anointing. An anointing is a divine enablement that enables us to do what we're not able to do naturally. So when Jesus came, they, they attached to him. <clears throat> they didn't, I don't think, had any understanding that he was the Christ, the eternal spirit that was active in all of creation. I don't think they understood what the anointing was really all about. But Christ is not a holy, sacred designation that was just given to Jesus. It's a designation that you and I carry. Now, we may not be called Billy Bob Christ or Mary Sue Christ, but the same anointing that resides on Jesus resides on us. Paul got it. John got it. Let me read what, what Paul said. And I, I, this is important as we get into to identity as divinity and begin to understand exactly what the Father is developing in us and in a community that is a large, you know, multifaceted community like the one you're part of this morning that you're watching. Paul got the thing about the anointing in 2 Second, Second Corinthians, and the anointing that he has is, is our anointing as well. So let me just, let me make this real... Uh, like my friend Darren Bagley used to say, let me just make this real legal for you and show you some scripture on that. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 21. Here's what Paul said. Verse 21. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ. Who, who establishes us in Christ? It's the Father. He who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us in God. So this anointing that we have because that we're in Christ or in the anointed one, carries with it a strong anointing in itself. And Paul recognized that. Now, John got it way back at the right hand of the book in John chapter 1, in John chapter um, 2, I'm sorry, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 20. 1 John chapter 2, verse 20, John said, you have an anointing from the Holy One. It's an impartation. It's an imputation of the anointing that the Holy One had, who was Jesus. That's who John's referring to. He, take, he took of what he had and imparted to us. You have an anointing from the Holy One, and you, boy, if this doesn't blow your mind, nothing will. 
and you know all things. That anointing has opened the door for, for an understanding and knowledge of wisdom and ability that is beyond the natural. Then he drops down in verse 27 and he says, the anointing which you have received from him, it abides in you. And you don't have need that anybody teach you. Now that doesn't mean you're arrogant, doesn't mean you're prideful, think you know it all. It just means because of verse 20, there is within you the eternal knower. In him dwell all the riches of wisdom and that wisdom resides in you. You know all things. So when people teach, like what I'm teaching here should be a... Uh, a resonating force within you that you go, that's it. I see that. I know that. I got it. I understand it. You don't need that anyone should teach you, but the anointing teaches you concerning A-L-L, all things, and it's true, and it's not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. Now, again, we may not call you Billy Bob Christ or Mary Sue Christ, but I want you to see from Scripture that, that, that creo, that, that Christ-in-ness, the Christ, it remains, it abides in you, and it's an active force that will teach us and show us what we didn't know before. So as we get into creating, that's extremely important because we have to know what to create and when to create it, and what knowledge there is to create is going to arise from within us. Now, let me just review last week real quick. If you, didn't, if you haven't seen last week's teaching, go back and look at it because as we get into this, I don't, you know, I'm going to use some terms and phrases that maybe traditional Christianity is going to frown on because they may have picked up the term in uh, some metaphysical book or some New Age teaching. And that's why I'm doing this. I want you to know that everything we do at the Digital Cathedral, everything I do on Wednesday night at the Secret Place, everything we do is Christ-centered. We are I am as an extension of I am that I am. Without I am that I am, we could never be I am. Are you, are you tracking with me? So I want us to understand that we, we're not moving off of our values. We're not moving off of the centrality of Christ. So I've talked, I talked to you last week, I gave you three things. Let me just mention them real quick. And then I wanna give you four more this morning. And they're gonna to have to be a rush job because um, we, I wanna finish it up because we need to get out of some other stuff. Last Sunday morning, we talked about the first thing that a real community that is developing divinity as identity, that is learning about I amness, is going to have to retain to be Christ centered is this. They're going to manifest, number one, they're going to manifest Jesus and nothing but Jesus. I'm a Jesus guy. I make no bones about it, make no apologies about it. I'm a Jesus guy. Our world needs desperately a full revelation a unrestricted revelation of Jesus and what he is all about and what he has done that enables us to do. All of the do that we're talking about with our I amness in creating, it comes out, our do comes out of what he has done. If he did not get it done in, in part and passed to us, then we could not do. So everything I am comes out of the I am that I am. So the first thing I want you to understand always is that we are here to show Jesus and lift him up and in lifting him up in the things that we teach, the things that we do, it's gonna be a magnet that draws people to the Savior, all right? Number two, number two, a, we're gonna we're gonna have a father, always presenting a father that looks like and acts like Jesus. This is probably the biggest need that our world has today is to get a right view of the father. The right view of the father came through Jesus. Jesus is the only one that has seen the Father, the only one that claimed, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And Jesus came, and I taught it last week, he came to clear up all the misconceptions, all the bad press, all the bad pictures, all the bad stories that had been told about the Father. Religion needs to apologize to the Father for all of the junk they have spread about him and told about him that was not true. true. All right, third thing we said last week, that he's developing in us and in a community that's going to keep us Christocentric. We are going to have the values and the ethics that Jesus taught, and we will then have a theology of Paul, right? Ethics and morals of Jesus. And I gave you two uh, uh, blocks of scripture for each, for Jesus and for Paul, that will explain how we live in the kingdom, which is, which is Jesus's metron, his measure of rule, is to teach us how to have high morals, how to live in the kingdom, how to ethically present ourselves, 
And you can, you can study that out for yourself in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and in John chapter 15. I'm not going to get into those. If you're really interested, read Matthew 5, 6, and 7. He'll talk about the ethics and the morals and the integrity that you and I need to walk in in the kingdom. And then Paul taught us good, solid theology. And there's two chapters I really like. I really hone in on these two, and I read them all the time because they reinforce a Christocentric theology. One is Romans chapter 5, and the other is 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You cannot read those two chapters and remain in a, a religious theology of Calvinism, Arminianism, or, or any other ism. You have to be able to absorb those theologies into your, into your life, and those are the things that we believe. So a grace community, all of the members in particular, should live like Jesus and believe like Paul. Does that make sense to you? We should live like Jesus and, uh, be, and, and believe like Paul. All right, so let's look at a couple more things this morning that are extremely important to keep in mind as we continue to develop. All right? Now, we're going to get back uh, we're going to get back to the I amness, but I, I just had to stop because I felt like after five weeks of, of, of moving into that dimension that I didn't want you to drift off from being Christ-centered. So I just, I just wanted to bring the balance back. I wanted to bring the right, right perspective that we have to hold and know that he's developing in us personally and in a, in a larger, broader community. He's building his church. The ecclesia is coming out of every, now I understand it, it's coming out of every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every culture, and you see it expressed here at the Digital Cathedral. He's building us. So we just need to stand back, listen, and keep focused on, on Jesus, amen? All right, so number three. A grace community and individuals in particular, it's gonna be developed into us that we have an understanding that obedience is not a is not a fruit, it's a root. And I'm gonna explain that. Obedience is not a fruit, it's a root. All right? it's, it's a root that comes out of, well, let, let me read it for you. John chapter 14, verse 23. John chapter 14, verse 23. And I want, I want you to see this verse in the right light. Maybe you've never looked at it this way before because religion has been strong in presenting this, I think, in an erroneous way. But he's developing in us the idea that obedience is not a fruit, it's a root. Now watch. Verse 23, Jesus answered and said to them, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come and make our, our, our home with him, our abode, our dwelling place with him. Jesus said, if anyone loves me, he'll keep my word. Now, how do you look at that verse? Let me tell you how religion looked at it. Religion looked at it like this. We keep the sayings of Jesus. We're obedient to Jesus to prove we love him. Because he said, if you love me, you'll do what I said. So religion takes that and says, you know what? We, we need to convince him that our level of love is genuine, that we really do love him, and we, we've got to please him. So the way we please him is to do what he said. Now, grace looks at it like this. Grace takes it at him at his word. If we love him, if we love him, then we automatically do what he says. So where grace puts the emphasis on love, religion puts the emphasis on obedience. So religion would look at, at the root of obedience that would produce this, this fruit of proving our love to him. Where grace comes along, it says, wait a minute, wait a minute, hold it, stop the bus. Let's put the emphasis on loving him and the doing what he said then is a natural flow. Paul said the same thing. In Romans chapter two and verse four, Paul said like this. He said, it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. Now religion taught, and here's the way I, I, I looked at it for years because of what I taught, I didn't know any different. I looked at it like this. If you, um, if you repent, if you repent, ball and squall and ask God to forgive you, that will release the goodness of God. But I have to repent to get the goodness. That's not what Paul said. Paul said it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. So when you, just saying what, what John said, when you see the goodness of God, when it floods your life, you know what? You change your mind. 
You see him in a light, you see you in a light, you see life in a light that you never saw before. Metanoia, you change your mind. The goodness of God leads us to a change of mind. It's not a change of mind or a repentance that leads us to the goodness of God. That's, that's bass backwards, guys. Come on. So when we look at Jesus, when Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Religion looks at it and says, you better obey to show him you love him. Because if you, if you don't obey, you're not being... You can't have a genuine love. And if you don't love him, he's going to separate himself from you eternally if you don't really do what he says. So you better be obedient, right? You better be obedient. That's not what John was getting at. John was emphasizing the love part. When you love him, you automatically, it's a natural flow, the root. The root then goes down and it produces what he says. It's not an issue of whether you'll do what he says, if you're, going to base, if you're going to base your love to Jesus on, on, on obedience to what he says, then you're producing a self-righteousness. You're basing your righteousness on your obedience to him. That's, that's, that's not right. That's not what he's at. And because the verdict on all self-righteousness is guilty. You can't do enough. You'll never attain a level of self-righteousness to make him happy. It's impossible. All, all that junk is like filthy rags. It's, it's a mess. The issue is whether you will just remain in the quiet place of his love for you. And out of that quiet place of love, the root of obedience goes down deep. It goes down deep. When you, you know, the reason I, my wife asks me to do something, the reason I do it is not to make her happy. The reason I do it is because I love her. When, you know, there's just the two of us. We're empty nesters now. So when dinner is done at night, I get up and I, I'm, my job, I, what I do is I clear the table and I put, you know, I wash the dishes off, put them in the dishwasher. I mean, she's cooked the meal. She's prepared sometimes all day long for dinner. So, you know, my love for her then will, will, will allow me to obey in one respect and, and do something for her. It's not because I want to, you know, please or make her happy. It's because of love. And the reason she cooked all day long a wonderful, beautiful dinner for just the two of us, because she loves me. It's not because she has to or because I, you know, I threatened to beat her or eternally torture her. <laughs> if she, good luck on that one. If she doesn't do what I tell her to do, are you with me? So love waters and feeds this root of obedience. It's not, it's not measuring what you do. It's measuring the love. The love, the love is 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 what what it's all about. It goes, it goes in in doing what he says. It, it just breeds it. You can't help it. So this is what we need to as a community, as individuals. What he's developing in us is this deep love that automatically we just follow along with what we know makes him happy and pleases him because that pleases us as well. All right, number five. Number five. He's developing in us. This is really important. And in our community at large, he's developing uh, the idea that we empower people to overcome sin. There's an empowerment that comes to overcome sin. Religion has done such a big job of emphasizing sin. Religion is obsessed with this thing of sin. First of all, they don't even know what sin is. They believe sin is behavior modification. They resist it, they fight it, they avoid it. They look at all the activities they think are contrary to what God wants and they try to make themselves come out of it. He's developing in us a people and in turn then a community that uh, is, has a Christ focus, not a sin focus. This is revolutionary. This is revolutionary because traditionally religion is very sin focused. In 1 John chapter 2, in verse 1, he said, uh, Little children, I write these things to you that you don't sin. Don't miss the mark. You understand who you are from the beginning. See, that's where divinity as identity comes in. What sin is, really, it's missing your identity as divinity. It's thinking you're something less than what you are. And because you think you're something less than what you are, you act, your behavior follows what you believe. See, you... So most of all of us believe we came out of Adam, that Adam jacked us up, messed us up. And that's what, well, you know, we have an endemic nature. That's why we, we live like this. No, no, no. Reason you act like this because you focused on it. You focused on first Adam rather than last Adam. Little children, I write to you that you don't sin. He said, but if any of you happen to miss the mark, 
He said, I want you to know that we have an advocate. We have a, 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 an attorney and his name's Jesus. So whenever you miss the mark, Jesus says, Father, look at those guys. They don't know what they're doing. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And he, he pleads our case and our righteousness is not infringed on. It's not neutralized. It's not kryptonited by anything that we knew. To embrace your divinity and to act out of your I amness, there can be no, listen, there can be no second thought about sin. Sin is gone. Hebrew said, the father said, their sins and their transgressions, I'll remember no more. I'll remember no more. Now you can bring them up and that's fine. You can ask him to forgive you. That's fine. He doesn't even remember them. He's not keeping score on your transgressions. The empowerment, and here's where as a grace community, we got to be strong. And as an individual, empowerment from sin or to get away from sin comes with a change of focus from what you did. Listen, it comes from a change of focus from what you did to what he has done. Let me say it in another way. It's moving the focus from sin consciousness to righteous consciousness. You, you, be, you, you will become whatever you focus on. Whatever your focused attention is on, that's what you're going to become. Where, wherever you focus your attention, your energy will flow there. And you will manifest it. That's part of creating. If you think, if you think you're just an old sinner, no good dog, worm in the dust, that's what you're going to manifest. You're going to reap a, 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 a harvest of that. If you think I'm just nervous, uptight, there's nothing I can do, I'm stressed all, that's what you're producing because that's what you're saying I am. Can that, can that get through to us? So in this area of sin, we need to begin to say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I am blameless and faultless before him in love. That's what he said you are. If that's what he said you are, then you are. Remember our verse from 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18 that we all with an unveiled face. This is a problem, is getting a veil off the face of people, the way they see things. We all with an unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory. When you look into that mirror of glory, you know what comes back? It's the way he sees you. That's a glory mirror. So when you look into a mirror of glory, what's, what shines back is glory. And when that becomes your focus, then that's what you are changed to. Am I getting through to you? So the power of sin comes by the self-judgment that you put on yourself because of what you did being ignorant of what he's done. As a grace person, as a grace community, the empowerment from sin comes when you look on Mr. Grace and what he accomplished for you. See, people tell me all that, well, you're just giving people license to sin. No, I'm not either. People say, well, you know, that's just a greasy old grace. People slide into sin. You're just telling people they can live any old way they want to. No, I'm not. I'm telling you what we've tapped into is the powering, empowerment to get the focus right, to become exactly what he said we are so we can say I am. This I am has really got a hold of me, and we're going to get into some things that's going to change the world. I'm telling you, you're going to be a creator. Stay with me. We've got your identity established as divinity. And when you are established into your identity as divinity, then you have been invited into the perichoretic circle of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They've opened up and they've invited you in. You have to be deity to get into that perichoretic circle. They didn't invite a dog or a horse or a monkey in. They invited you in. And they've embraced you in that. Now watch what the power of grace really is. Titus chapter 2. I can't get my, you know, I have a lot of, a lot of pastor friends and people, and so not many have hung with me, but I, I do have some. And this is a verse that's really hard for them to swallow because when they hear me teaching grace and the freedom that grace brings, and it's always going back to this thing of cheap, cheap salvation or whatever. But here's what, here's what grace will do. Verse 11, it says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Well, I like that. Grace has brought salvation to everybody. Now, some it's appeared to right now, some they haven't, it hasn't appeared to yet. Doesn't, doesn't affect the truth of that, of that 11th verse. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Watch. This grace that has appeared to all men will teach us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. 
The real thing that will teach us how to live rightly is grace. Grace is not an empowerment to sin. Grace is an empowerment that frees you from sin. The biggest sin-plagued church that Paul dealt with was the Corinthian church. Man, they were messed up morally. They were messed up in dishonesty, bickering, causing divisions. They, they were split seven ways. Now watch what Paul does with them. Watch, watch how Paul dealt with them. First Corinthians, right out of the bag. First Corinthians chapter one. Watch, I want you to see how Paul looks at them and what Paul begins to say about them in 1 Corinthians chapter one. You ain't gonna get this in church. Here's what he said to these people that were immoral, <laughs> disobedient, walking in strife and division and jealousies. 1 Corinthians chapter one and verse two. He said to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, first thing he calls them sanctified. Boy, the, the, the background I came out of would have never called the Corinthian church sanctified. Called to be saints. He says they're saints. They're called to be saints. They're sanctified saints. Who all, who all who is in every place call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace and peace to you from God. He's saying, look, grace and peace is extended to you from God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Sanctified stay, saints, grace and peace extended. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus that you were enriched in everything by him, in all utterance and knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, one more verse. Who will also confirm you to the end, who will confirm you to the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. What is he saying? What is he saying to them? He exposes them to who they really are. He didn't get after them and say, you bunch of no good sinners, you better repent. I'm telling you what, you're headed to hell. That's not what he called. He, he was in, Paul was empowered to break the power of disobedience and missing the mark, not knowing who they were. Through, that, through those five, six, seven verses right there, he just lays out very systematically, methodically, calling them and planting in them who they are. He said, it's going to be confirmed, confirmed in you blameless to the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't, I'm not gonna go back, but you can read verse eight and he just, he just lays it out for them. See, the church, is, the church has never had revealed to them who the Father says they are. So all the I am's that you have heard proclaimed in the church has always been I am not. I am not worthy. I am not righteous. I am not good enough. Because the power of sin has been exalted, sin consciousness has been deeply entrenched and embedded in people till they don't know if they're going and coming. We aren't changed by our resolve. We're not changed by sheer determination. We've learned that as individuals. That's what our community stands for. See, that our discipline hasn't changed us. We're changed as we behold the glory of the Christ within. That's what 2 Corinthians 3.18 is all about. We're being changed into what we focus on, seeing who you are, who you've always been, conforms you into that image of knowing who you've always been. Embracing divinity as identity, embracing I am that I am as my I am, I'm telling you what, you look into the mirror, you're gonna see the glory reflected back. If we can grasp that for ourselves, if we can grasp that for ourselves, then you know what, that's gotta headline our community. Because as we dive deep into the things of God, as we discover mysteries that today, I'm telling you, mysteries are being laid out that generations past have never seen before. So just brace yourself. Brace yourself. And let me just say again, don't believe it because I'm telling it to you. Take it, take it to the spirit of truth within and ask him if what we're doing at the digital cathedral is right or wrong, if we're teaching truth or error. Don't believe me. Test it. Test it. Dig it out for yourself. See what you find. All right, number six. Number six. Individually and as a community, number six, we should promote security and trust for the believer. And for the pre-believer, that's what brings them into believing. There's only two groups of people. Those that have seen it and those that haven't seen it yet but will. That's the only two groups of people on, on, on the planet. There's no such thing as an unbeliever. There's just someone that hasn't been awakened yet. They're, and I call them pre-believers 
Because every knee is going to bow, every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God. That's not a forced confession. That's a willful action. Might, might be this, this life might be uh, when we transition. I don't know, but I'll tell you what, it's coming. So we need to build that security into people. What if people knew? What if people knew when they transitioned that the Father was more loving, more caring, more joyful, more peaceful, more accepting than they ever ever thought possible? And at that, at that transition is actually better than this life. People would not be afraid to die. Once the fear of death is removed, you can't intimidate somebody. So we need to bring that, that level of security. All right, let me read John chapter 10. John chapter 10. I try to nail points when I make them here at the Digital Cathedral. I try to nail it down with some scripture because I know that's what we like. So we got to have a verse for it, right? John chapter 10, verse 27. Jesus said this, My sheep hear my voice. My sheep hear my voice. And I know them and they follow me. He's trying to say, guys, you, you do hear me. I, I, I'm, I'm building security. I'm building trust in you. And he says, watch verse 28. And I give them eternal life. I never heard that in church. I heard that eternal life was a choice, a decision that you had better make in this lifetime or it was not ever going to be given. You will never get it. Jesus said, and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish, never going to die, and neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. He has got hold of us and we're not coming out of his hand. He said, he's, he, those are, I don't know how much stronger you can make a promise of security than what he gives us in John, Jesus himself in John chapter 10, verse 27 and 28. Security and trust comes by, by standing on his promises to us. See, I trust his promises to me. Religion taught me to stand on the promises I make to him. I had to make promises to him. Then he would respond to the promise if I made to him. Like, Lord, I'm gonna, I promise you I'm going to live for you all my life. Lord, I promise you I'll never sin. Lord, I promise you that all the days of my life I give to you. You know what would happen? I'd break the promise. I'd break the promise. Grace does not stand on promises we make to him. This is a revelation for some of you. Grace stands on the promises that he's made to us. So when I would make a promise to him, and I made a lot of them, everyone I made, I broke, I believe. And when I broke the promise, I felt like I let God down. And there's a lot of people out there today that aren't, aren't, aren't in church. They're not fellowshipping. They're not connected. They haven't been awakened yet. You know why? Because they promised God something and they didn't keep the promise and they felt they let God down. And what I did when I broke the promise, all the promise I made broke, I'll tell you what I did. We fall back into religion. We double down on what we do. We double down on the promises. The way that you fall from grace is not sin. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 4, let me, let me give you this because this again, you don't hear this in church. What you hear in church is if you sin, you fall from grace. Now, some of you know exactly where I'm going with this because I've taught you. Galatians 5, 4 says, you, you have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. You know what I did every time I made a promise to God and broke it? I would put myself under some kind of legalistic law that said I had to double down and make sure I was more sincere and more stringent with the promise that I would make to him. And again, I'd make a promise and I'd break it. I'd break it. Where's the security in that? Where's, where's the trusting in him at, in me making promises and breaking them, thinking that he would be angry with me, vengeful, hateful, vindictive, and punitive toward me because I broke a promise that I made to him. That's not, what, that's not what this is about. This life that we're living is about the promises he's made to us. That's where our security lies. We've been conditioned to work at building a system of security through trying to stay on God's good side. Let's be honest. We tried to be obedient to stay on God's good side. The problem is we were never fully, completely assured within ourselves that we were there. So death was, was to be feared because, man, you might, you're going to stand before God and he's going to play this, <clears throat> this video on a huge screen, show every event of your life, every dark deed, every dark thought that you had hidden from everybody. He's going to put it right up on that screen for everybody to see. How's that going to make you feel? You better repent today. You better, right? You better make that promise again. 
<clears throat> religion plays on uncertainty and the fear. It plays on the fear of what may happen. And that's how they keep you in line. That's how they kept you obedient for so many years. That's how they kept you tithing. <clears throat> if you don't tithe, you're not obedient, you're tithing, you're going to be cursed with a curse. But if you tithe and you're obedient, the windows of heaven open to you. That's a, that's a life from the pit of hell. God blesses you. Rain falls on the just, the unjust. Sun shines on the just, the unjust. God loves you, not because of what you do, but it's because of the promises he's made to you. And when we broke all these promises, you know what a lot of people did? I have, I have family that this happened to. They just quit trying. They threw up their hands and said, I give up. I quit. Let me say it again. Religion stands on the promises you make to him. Bad way to live. Grace stands on the promises that he's made to you. Grace comes and says, if you could have done it, <laughs> Jesus could have kept his feet up on the footstool in heaven and just stayed there. You couldn't do it. You never could do it. You never could be righteous enough, good enough, obedient enough because he comes as you and was obedient as you. You can rest in peace. You can rest in peace. The one who started the work in you is going to be the one that is able and very diligent to finish the work. The one who holds, the, think about this, the one who holds the universe in his hands, pulls all the strings for the universe, does everything to keep the cosmos running. It, that one certainly has enough energy and strength to hold you in his hands eternally, eternally. He, he brought you into that circle. Let me say it again. He brought you into the circle of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit so that now you're joined in that group. He has brought you in as a heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus. They brought you in as a equal, a co-equal. Oh, my goodness. Some of you just clicked off right there. That's the truth. They have brought you. You're a species of being. You're a new creation. You never existed before. As a result of the crucifixion, you died with him. The resurrection, you resurrected with him. I'm telling you, we've got security supreme. Power, power of every adversarial force has been broken over your life. And you're living today as he is in this present world. We're just awakening to it. We're awakening. That's why divinity is identity. I did that for I don't know how many weeks. I taught the Christ is us life for 38, 39 weeks. We're at this point right now, brother, where we're going to move into another dimension of, of being a creator. You've created a lot, whether you realize it or not. You pretty much have created the life that you live right now by your choices, decisions, moods that you've allowed to come in. You've, you've created this. Man has created the, the world that we live in. And when the, when the collective consciousness of man changes, the world will change. It's not God's fault people starving to death today. It's not God's fault people are in abject poverty. We've, we've, we've created that through greed and lust, fear of lack, People run to the grocery store, get 68 packages of toilet paper back when the pandemic. Did, they, nobody uses more toilet paper than they ever used. There was enough for everybody. Do you get, do you get that? But because we thought there was going to be a shortage, we, we hoarded for ourselves. There's enough water. There's enough money. There's enough gold. There's enough good. There's enough food for everybody in the world. Man has created it. Man's created it. And when the collective consciousness, when kingdom consciousness, this is why it's so important, we're, we're, we're leavening the lump. When kingdom consciousness begins to leaven the lump of the world and the, and the collective consciousness of the world changes, the world that we live in will change. You know how it's going to end up? It's going to be here as it is there. This, this dimension will be as the other dimension. The two dimensions are coming into one. That's why, you're, that's why we're coming into a season of being able to create because the two dimensions are coming into one. And I don't want to lose sight of the dimension that we are to focus on, which is the kingdom. Seek first the kingdom. All these things, divinity is identity. All these things, your I am as they come out of a life in the kingdom that is Christ-centered and Christ-focused. Don't get me going, I'll be preaching. All right, number seven. What's he doing in us? What's he doing in our community? He's developing a church that will look, talk, and walk like Jesus. Now, it may shock you. It's going to shock your religious sensibilities, how Jesus walked and how Jesus talked. I'm going to give you, this is probably just about the last verse of scripture I got because I'm running out of time. But let me show you something. Matthew chapter 11. It's, we're going to develop a community that looks, walks, and talks like Jesus. Now, I told you about his ethics, his integrity, his, mor his morals that he, that he imparted to us in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, which is really the Sermon on the Mount. You go over and read those. I'm going to, I'm going to talk about those next week. 
I want to talk about the overlying principle that we have to live out of next week. It's going to blow your mind. Watch this. Matthew chapter 11. A, a, a grace community, digital cathedral. I'm calling you today. We need to walk, talk, and, and look like Jesus. Here's, here's the way he did it. Matthew chapter 11, verse 19. The Son of Man came eating and drinking. Not talking about water or grape juice. You check it out. And they said, look, a glutton and a wine bibber. They didn't say, look, look there. There's a guy that, that overeats and drinks too much grape juice. They called him a wine bibber. A wine bibber. Let, let me just check the center reference. I haven't done this yet, but let me just check the center reference on this. I see it's got a little note. That means a wine drinker. A wine bibber means a wine drinker. They said, there, look at that Jesus. Look at him. He said, and it said, he's a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is justified by your children. In other words, what you produce is going to show who you are. They looked at Jesus. Now, we're, look, we're producing a community that's going to walk, talk, look like Jesus. And what did Jesus look like? He looked like a guy that kind of enjoyed life to me. He wasn't opposed to having a good meal. I, I, I like a good filet. Give me a filet, baked potato, salad with some ranch dressing on it, some vegetable. I'll tell you what, I love it. And I love a glass. I'll just tell you the truth. I enjoy a good glass of wine with that meal. I'm not, I wouldn't put myself in a category of a, of a drinker, but I do have a drink now and then. If I go to, I go to Mexican food, you think I'm not going to have a frozen margarita? Come on, get real. I remember sitting in a restaurant when I was <clears throat> still pastoring and I had a glass of wine you know, with, with my meal <clears throat> and there was a lady from the church back there. I go, you know what? I felt condemned. I felt bad. Like, man, what is she going to think of the pastor? Do you see how hip hypocritical we can become? We're going to be, we're a community that we're going to have friends of the tax collectors and the sinners because we, we don't have friends in the evangelical church anymore. They've, they've, they've left us, man. They've left us. Jesus got past a huge obstacle. I'm past it. I got past that. that happening in that restaurant one day got, past, got me past something. And that was having any concern for what people thought or said about me. I used to be so, so image conscious because I was the pastor and there were people that would look at me every Sunday, you know, like I was supposed to be perfection in motion. I was not perfect. I'm not perfect today. But what a relief it is to live in grace and not have to be perfect. <laughs> not have to be perfect. Our community accepts everybody. It's an inclusive community. This is the community that inclusion is building. Inclusion is building. You, 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 you know you're embracing the right stuff. You know you're embracing identity as divinity. You know you're starting to em em emphasize your I amness. When you as an individual and a community, when, when the tax collectors and, and the sinners are drawn to you, are drawn to you, and the self-righteous leave in a huff. You know you're hitting on some good stuff right there. A grace community is where the prodigals come home and the zealots leave. So I hope that we have a lot of prodigals. I hope that we have pre-believers. Uh, I hope that we have people that are just coming into truth. I know we're not going to get very many righteous here, self-righteous, because they're going to leave and They're not going to like what I talk about, not going to like what I teach. But you're part of something that's bigger than that. What's the Holy Spirit doing in you? Let me just say this. What's the Holy Spirit doing in this community? He's making us a walking billboard of grace that all the world can read. And sometimes the self-righteous, they've got to go so that the pre-believers can come in and not feel judged or excluded. Jesus is building his church. He's building an ecclesia. He's building called out ones. And I'm seeing it now from every nation, every tribe, every tongue. He's doing it, guys, right before our eyes. We're seeing it happen. We're seeing it happen. You're part of it. I'm part of it. Together, together we're doing this. He, and he's bypassing the institutional church. The day the brick and mortar building right now is hurting. Will there be brick and mortar buildings that spring up where people gather? I believe there will be. But this is not the day for that. Very, very rare. Very rare. God's house in Houston, Texas is one of the few that I know that really is proclaiming a pure gospel, grace, identity as divinity message. There will be those that come up. Right now, it's bypassing the institutional church. He's going straight into the hearts and the lives of people. That's how he got me. 
sitting in my office third on the second story of our 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 campus all kinds of things going on he went straight to my heart he didn't come through the system he didn't come through uh you know the the district superintendent or the prophet or the apostle he came straight into my heart let's stand back let's just stand back take our hands off of it let him develop us individually and as a community people that emphasize Jesus. It's going to take us into some phenomenal things. And it's a good day to be alive, man. You have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Don't you ever doubt it. Don't you ever doubt it. God bless you. Thank you for, for partnering with me. This is a good message. We're carrying it around the world and uh, we're making the journey together. And all I can tell you is it's going to get gooder and gooder. God bless you. We'll see you next week at the Digital Cathedral. And don't forget Wednesday night on the Don Keithley Ministry page, 7 o'clock Central. And we'll go through a little bit more of this again. Don't forget to hit the subscribe, the like, and leave a comment on the YouTube page. These comments that you made during the, the teaching are not going to be there. But if you go over to YouTube, you can come down and make a good comment. And people read the comments and then they look at the teaching. Make a comment. When I post it on Facebook, make a comment because people will view it if it looks like it's worth looking at. And I think this is worth looking at. Again, see you next time. God bless you. Have a wonderful week and a Christ-centered week.